welcome to another episode of Unplugged, a pathology version. So I've chosen chosen a topic to discuss today to uh, first of all help you revise, second to give you some material that you can add to your notes and third to help you identify certain visuals. So it's going to be both visual and at the end I'm going to put everything together in a table for you. Okay, so let's begin. The topic for today is granulomas. So granulometer's information I know troubles a lot of people, it's, it's almost everywhere and still we can't seem to figure out what kind and where. So let's first start looking at what kind of granulomas are there and what, what is a granuloma. So to quote the first person to give the definition of granuloma way back from this journal article, a granuloma is a compact organized collection of mature mononuclear phagocytes, which are macrophages and or epithelioid cells, which may or may not be accompanied by accessory features like micro or other inflammatory cells which brings us to one very important one-liner from this is the principal cell of a granuloma is an epithelioid cell or an epithelioid histiocyte which is a macrophage correct so what happens is initially there is a monoblast which matures into a promonocyte again a monocyte which comes out of the blood into tissue into macrophages and it becomes a stimulated macrophage which is like an immature form of epithelioid cells which all then fuse together to form multinucleated giant cells now if you look at different types of giant cells, this first one, I'm sure all of you can see multinucleation towards the center. So a lot of nuclei are aggregated towards the center. This is called a foreign body type of giant cell. Whereas in the other type of giant cell, you will see the nuclei are towards the periphery in what we call a wreath-like or a horseshoe shaped pattern. These are Langhans type giant cells. Now, depending on this, uh, we usually tend to classify granulomas into foreign body granulomas and immune granulomas. But more than that, there are also other types of giant cells. Two classical examples. First is this cell. If I were to ask you to describe the cell, you'd say there is a circular arrangement of nuclei with some pink, pink material in between. And then again, there is some pale area around it. So it's like pink nuclei and pale, pink nuclei and pale. And this is a classical picture of a two-tone type giant cell. A two-tone type giant cell is seen in lipid rich uh, lesions like xanthomas, xanthogranulomas, even fat necrosis in which you can get dystrophic calcification at times. So you get a ring of nuclei surrounding a central eosinophilic zone and a zone of pallor towards the periphery. Remember, two-tone type giant cell. There's one more, which I'm sure you come across in ortho a lot, mononuclear, uh, sorry, uh, multinucleated osteoclast type giant cells. So osteoclast like giant cells are multinucleated giant cells which have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and they have around 100 nuclei and those nuclei have a little bit of peripheral chromatin but more than that you can see they're all very nicely clumped together and of course when you know the lesion that you're going to see it in you'll come to know that this is an osteotype like giant cell. Now this photograph is actually from an osteoclastoma. You can see osteoclast like giant cells which are not the tumor cells but the background stromal cells that you can see the monomononuclear cells tiny tiny those are the tumor cells. So this is just another photograph for osteoclastoma or giant cell tumor of the bone. Now, like I told you before, a foreign body giant cell is very classically seen when we have inert foreign bodies in the absence of a very brisk T cell immune mediated response. And it's just a way to, you know, uh, ward off or physically barricade the foreign body. That's all. And you can see the epithelioid and giant cells will be close to the surface of the foreign body trying to, you know, phagocytose it. Whereas on the other hand, an immune granuloma will have persistent T-cell mediated response and it usually uh, takes place when the inciting agent is a little difficult to eradicate. Maybe it's a self-antigen like we can see in sarcoidosis at times or it's a persistent microbe like we see in TB which can lead to cell uh, delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Now usually what happens is T-cells, the helper T-cells very important. The cytokine they secrete is interferon gamma which helps to recruit and activate more and more macrophages, more and more cytokines are released and more and more cells are recruited which then forms a compact mass they call granuloma. Now pathogens usually not destroyed by the acute inflammatory response, they, became, they become contained in macrophages and they form just a collection of macrophages that we call mature granuloma, immature, uh, just, just a mature granuloma and sometimes these resistant organisms can be destroyed but sometimes when they persist it gives rise to a delayed hypersensitivity at which point of time the mature granulomas turn into what we call epithelioid granulomas, the macrophages become epithelioid histiocytes and 
then the organism can be destroyed. So in front of you is a very generic and a very simplified classification of granulomas. Granulomas can be neoplastic, uh, neoplastic and non-neoplastic. And the non-neoplastic, remember, they can be infectious and non-infectious. Infectious, one classical example is tuberculosis, but then you also have non-tuberculous causes of granuloma, some of which we will see. Under non-infectious, some of them can be immune-mediated, and then there are some miscellaneous causes, like maybe some endogenous or exogenous substances. And there are some cancers, very classically known to have granulomas, which we will shortly see. So this first photograph, here are four photographs. The first one is a low-power view. You can see a central area of necrosis. No nuclei, nothing, just pink, 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 pink area. That central necrosis, which on gross to me would look like cheese-like appearance, so it's called caseous necrosis. I'm sure you can identify some uh, giant cells, which are in, you know, a little more highlighted here. Langhans type giant cells, as I'm sure you'll know now, necrosis, and a lot of inflammatory cells. Right? In this photograph, again, you can see some, a little bit of necrosis here. Those dark, dark blots are lymphocytes, and this is another giant cell. And this is AFP, positive for TB. So this is a classical picture for caseating necrosis, a caseating necrotic granuloma uh, for TB. This is a pastain slide. Uh, you have uh, giant cells and, and you know, epithelioid cells forming a granuloma. But does anyone, I, I hope you can identify certain organisms there on the top which are long and acutely branching. I don't know how many of you will be able to recognize this, but this is Aspergillus, which will become even more obvious when we do GMS stain, right? Another photo, uh, this is colon with a uh, granuloma here, and these two are actually ova of schistosoma. So see, even parasites can cause, helminths can also cause a granulomatous inflammation. Sometimes post-BCG, which I'm sure, you know, is an attenuated form of mycobacterium, used as a vaccine against TB, but as I'm sure you know, it's also used as an intralesional treatment for some dermal malignancies and intravesical for superficial bladder cancer. Following this, also sometimes you can get granuloma. See, this is in a vessel. This patient was given intralesional BSBCG for melanoma, and there's a Langhans type giant cell, and this is a granuloma formation within a vessel, a granulomatous angitis. This is a gross photograph, which I'm sure most of you will recognize. Hyalur lymphadenopathy, bilateral, sarcoidosis. Uh, sarcoidosis is characterized by well-formed, the keyword being non-necrotizing granulomas of aggregates of tightly clustered epithelial macrophages with giant cells. Central necrosis is unusual, please remember that. And usually we see it around airways, blood vessels, and fibrous septa. It has a very interstitial involvement. And lymphatics can be associated, and which uh, whatever the agent would have caused the uh, change or caused the reaction can then be disseminated via it. Now, hypercalcemia, as I'm sure all of you recall, is a very classical feature of sarcoidosis. And this occurs because of increased intestinal calcium absorption. And why that occurs is because there is increased uh, activity of uh, conversion of calcitriol to Oh, sorry, calcidiol to calcitriol by activated mononuclear cells. 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3 helps then in increasing absorption because of which there is hypercalcemia. Laminated concretions composed of calcium and proteins are also seen called Sherman bodies. Don't forget asteroid bodies, those star-shaped cells, star-shaped structures within the giant cells. Remember, Sherman bodies are proteins and calcium, which means they will stain for calcium as well. Remember, they are not pathognomonic for sarcoidosis. And in sarcoid, you get naked granulomas. Naked granulomas just means that in the periphery of the granulomas, you will not see lymphocytes that we normally see as a cover. There will be more of a fibroblastic proliferation. So you can see two really pretty asteroid bodies here star-shaped. Here is one more asteroid body within a giant cell. And this is a bronchus, bronchiole here in this. And I hope here on this part, these blue-blue cells that you're seeing are the nuclei of lymphocytes. And these are all giant cells forming granulomas. Um, if, if you can appreciate around the granulomas, there's not much lymphocyte cover. They're either bare 
or there is fibroblast proliferation. So if I'm ever in a doubt, see here also you can see there's a granuloma with a lot of you know collagenous deposition around it. Because of which if I were to do a reticulin stain to look for this fibrosis, I might get something like this. You can see very discrete granulomas. You can see black black threads of fibrosis around the granulomas. So this is sarcoid granuloma classical. Remember we will use a reticulin stain if you're ever in doubt to figure out that these are sarcoid granulomas. Hodgkin lymphoma is a neoplasm that you should remember has been associated with granulomas. It doesn't have necrosis and doesn't have any kind of other bodies. And they say that there is longer survival of patients with epithelioid granulomas, maybe because it's an immune response. And uh, if there is a very high level of a high number of epithelioid cells, that Hodgkin's is classified as miscellularity. Other neoplasms that are associated with granulomas are peripheral T-cell lymphoma, uh, granulomatous slack skin disease, which is a variant of mycosis fungoides, seminoma, dysgerminoma, germinoma, adenocarcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. For adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, the products that they make, like mucin and keratin, can act like a foreign body, and because of that, there can be granulomatous reaction. Uh, just some interesting photographs for you. This is a polarizing microscopy of talc, and this is a talc granuloma. This is, I don't know, forensic, can you guys recall? hair, this is a hair granuloma. This is, uh, I hope it reminds you of Pacman, that game we used to play when we were kids. This is colloid, this is Pacman, colloid granuloma. Uh, all of that brownish material that you're seeing is suture material. So this is a suture granuloma, you can see the giant cells. And uh, this is uh, some crystal inside. This is in IV, this can be seen in IV drug users. This is within a vessel. Um, this is again some asteroid bodies and this was actually from a silicone breast transplant, uh, breast implant. And this is some vegetable matter which has caused granulomatous response uh, like an aspiration pneumonia at times. And this is a very brisk uh, granuloma formation in an adenocarcinoma. This is actually from colonic adenocarcinoma which is metastasized to a lymph node and that lymph node is showing a granulomatous response. So to summarize, this is the time I'm going to ask all of you to take out your notes, maybe pause the video right after I say this and take down this table. This table is of the conditions which, are, which have granulomas at times and whether they are necrotizing and non-necrotizing. As you can see, TB can have both. Of course, single best answer will remain necrotizing. It can have cheese-like necrosis on gross, so we call it caseating. Leprosy has non-necrotizing. Cat scratch has necrotizing more than non-necrotizing. And the cat scratch granulomas are classically star-shaped stellate. Syphilis is necrotizing, brucellosis can be both, Q fever has non-necrotizing but fibrin ring, Veginers, Chirkstraws are both necrotizing and can be both in, within the vessel and outside the vessel, though they can be extravascular granulomas in both. Fungal infections can mimic TB granulomas a lot. Sarcoid and Crohn's very classically non-necrotizing. Large vessel vasculitis, both Takayasu and giant cell can have granulomas and metastatic carcinoma like you just saw can have non-necrotizing granulomas so pause this video at this point at least and then take down this this uh, table so that it answers a lot of questions for you it helps you revise and it puts everything in one place all right so i hope uh, this video helped uh, do follow us on the dams delhi channel on youtube videos and do let me know if there's uh, any confusion regarding any granuloma all the very best